two source interference because obviously two sources is the easiest to do. So um, if you've got two sources, then let's uh, actually start with a, a, just a very brief recap of uh, the lecture last time because I'm going to, to use this uh, result. Um, there was a bit of confusion caused because I've used both complex exponential method and cosine method. Uh, so I'll just say a word on that. That um, obviously, you, you know, like I was doing th this cos theta plus i sine theta, I can express a wave either in the form e to the i kx minus omega t. And again, sometimes you'll see it written as e to the omega t minus kx. That's both of those are a wave travelling in positive x direction. But also, I could express this, if you like, just as the real parts, as cos kx minus omega t, or cos omega t minus kx. These are equally, uh, again, we might multiply them all by some amplitude. These are all waves just travelling in the positive x direction, plane waves. And I can either work with the real parts from the outset, which is fine when you're just doing two adding up two things, because then you can use simple trig relationships. But in general, it's probably better to use this. However, you'll see a lot of text, optics textbooks will add up cosines, a lot will add up complex exponentials. But you're doing the same physics, there's no, there's no difference. You're adding up waves, that's the whole point of um, interference and diffraction. And when you do it with the cosines for two waves, which you've got, and remember too, this um, it, it, it comes into its own today, that this phase, th these would be with some arbitrary phase set equal to zero, but in general, they can have some inherent phase to the oscillations. And uh, it, this, this phi 1 and phi 2, as written here, could be due to both the kx term, in other words, the waves have travelled different distances to get to a point, or some inherent um, driver of the oscillations. And uh, you know, I mentioned with this Yagi antenna, I mean, in the, um, <coughs> in the end, you can put an input signal, and you, you, you know, we can actually control how these fire successively to create specific directional effects. We don't have to drive the electrons up this one, up this one, up this one, up this one, all at the same time. We could choose, and this is our own signal generator connected here, to drive them at any arbitrary phase difference to each other. So we do need to include that idea, although mostly we'll be concerned with the case where this phase difference is just due to the different distance that oscillators that are inherently in phase then come out of phase because they've travelled different distances. And the amplitude of the resultant wave, again, it's just adding two cosines. Is, um, um, uh, this is the resultant. It's, it's oscillating, of course, at some frequency and some average phase of the, the two oscillations. We're usually interested just in the amplitude, this factor at the front here. And if we called this difference in amplitude, uh, excuse me, in phase between the two waves phi, we get this result. So we went on from this to uh, five-fold uh, antenna. And of course, a, a yet another example um, is this one here. You could have a six dipole antenna. This one here, and, and, unless you, if you just neglect this, this one extra pole is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten pole antenna. And there's no difference whatsoever between interference and diffraction. Diffraction is just when the number of oscillators becomes large. So I think that's worth stating right at the beginning is, um, in a sense, uh, physically, there is no difference between interference and diffraction. So there's no new principles involved at all. It's just that we've got to add up a lot more waves when we do diffraction. And um, normally, when the number of sources is small, we call it interference. Interference. 
Well, let's call it there so I don't have to repeat it. Let's say the number n of sources is small. We call it interference. When n is large, it's called diffraction. And let's say, oops, the tur there's no specific turnover point where suddenly interference becomes diffraction at n is equal to exactly 6 or 10 or something like that. But just normally, let's say if n is about 10 or so, we'd still retain the idea of interference. For example, this device is called, and if you use it as a radio telescope, it's called an interferometer rather than a diffractometer. But if you've got a diffraction grating, and I have brought a few with me so we can liven our lecture up with a, a bit of colour this morning. If you've got a diffraction grating for light, then uh, typically you'd have probably about 10,000 scratches, parallel scratches on the glass plate. So if you've got 10,000 parallel scratches giving you, uh, and, and let's say again, a plane wave comes from behind, if you like, it's like extending this again and again and again 10,000 times, but now we're on a, a completely different length scale. You definitely wouldn't call this an interference grating. You'd call it a diffraction grating. Certainly when n is 10,000, uh, you're talking about uh, diffraction. So um, how are we going to handle that problem? Actually, before, first, let me just say, I mean, again, this is, you know, sort of like backup type uh, material. Let's just let's be a bit clearer, won't it, with the, uh, the light down here. Um, th you know, like these, these gratings that I, I've brought in, that I'll pass around in a bit, um, it, a typical one has got about 5 times 10 to the 5 lines per metre. In other words, the distance d between the adjacent sources. And, you know, if we hit a, a, a diffraction grating with a plane wave, if you like, the scratches all act as a kind of secondary source. And so, as I say, it's just like the Aggie antenna, in, but of course in a different wavelength regime. So, uh, if you've got a typical diffraction grating, well, d might be 2 microns, and then a typical red light wavelength would be you know, let's say 600 nanometers. And again, you know, I used this example before of lambda over d being about 0.3. Um, you, of course, you get giant maxima at uh, when we meet this so-called, now, now we'll call it the diffraction condition, if you like, that sine theta is m lambda over d. And of course, this has solutions. Again, always you get the straight through beam, the m equals naught beam, because they're all going to add up in phase um, in the, and, and again, I use this analogy because it's very obvious that if you're right down the middle of the lecture theatre, the, 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 these are all going to add up in phase because there's no path difference. And so you have got uh, a straightforward diffraction condition. And it's made more tricky when you look at diffraction grating with white light because, of course, you've got a spread of wavelengths between about 400 and 700 nanometers. So the red, the blue, the green all get spread out because they get diffracted at different conditions. And indeed, that's one of the uses of a diffraction grating is precisely to split white light into its um, constituent components. So that will be a typical diffraction grating. Um, and I, do, I want to mention also that although I said, you know, there are kind of exceptions to everything, that we weren't really going to go down in wavelength from the light regime, because if you like, as we head down in this direction towards the X-rays, the photon nature of the light becomes more and more important. But wave-particle duality holds absolutely everywhere. And uh, I'm sure, having done solid-state physics, you're, you're well aware of the existence of X-ray diffraction, which is the main technique that we might use to determine the structure of a solid. And let's just say we're looking, not, not going to do the full 3D diffraction analogy, of course, but let's just say we're looking in a particular direction in a solid, and the unit cells, if you like, are, for, and I've chosen this number, obviously, deliberately to give a nice division, but it's very typical. I mean, chemists use this angstrom unit, which is because, you know, so we like to think between 1 and 10, and most... Um, 
solids, the atoms, are a few angstroms apart, or a few times 10 to the minus 10, well, you're getting onto the nuclear physics, and the copper K alpha is often used in standard X-ray diffractometers, like the one in the um, third year teaching lab that um, you, and I, I, there's a small diffractometer even in the, the, the second year lab. I think you do some basic X-ray diffraction. Well, then your wavelength is 1.54 angstroms, and your lambda over D is 0.3. And then, etc. Obviously, you're going to get your X rays diffracted at a particular condition. And indeed, you use it the other way round, if you like. Conceptually, uh, you know your incoming wavelength, you orient your crystal in a particular way, and exactly you determine the structure of the crystal. And as you turn it, you bring different crystal planes into the diffraction condition, and you see spots, bright spots. And what you, for example, let's say this was on, along the z-axis of a layer crystal, then m is 1, m is 2, and m is 3. We call the 001, the 002, and the 003 reflections in X-ray diffraction. So, it, it, you know, what I'm saying about diffraction applies over a huge regime of wavelengths. It's the matching condition of your separation of the sources a pr being of that order of magnitude as the... Um, wavelength of the radiation. So that's, um, you know, just, that's just kind of background because uh, that's, that, that, that's just saying, well, look, this does apply over a wide regime of the electromagnetic spectrum. So uh, that's the, 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 the sort of backdrop. Again, we got as far as this at the problem class on Wednesday. We actually looked at fi a five dipole antenna and we looked at, um, this is just a, a sketch of a six dipole antenna. And you can see again, we got these zeros at two pi fifths, four pi fifths, six pi fifths, eight pi fifths, when we had a five dipole antenna. And now we've got zeros at two pi six, four pi six, eight pi six, ten pi six. And then when we go back to 2 pi, we go back to a giant maximum. And we get, you know, I, I did the math very thoroughly of why we get these little bumps in between, because we had that uh, form factor, if you like. Again, to use an X-ray type analogy, we had this kind of F of phi for the 5 dipole antenna was 1 plus 2 cos phi plus 2 cos 2 phi, and then when we squared this to get the intensity of the light, we got this uh, very typical pattern where we had a giant maximum, then these little bumps in between, then another giant maximum, and of course, pattern repeats as you go past 2 pi, because um, once phases are out by 2 pi, if they go out by the range 2 pi to 4 pi, that's the same as the range 0 to 2 pi, because the waves are just are being shifted by the same amount. So um, the maths of that is quite, you know, we did, if you like, explicitly. And uh, that's illustrated in figure uh, 63 here of the course handout, how we do the maths for six oscillators. Of course, we could add up the waves, yeah? We could do that. Uh, but in this case, our... Um, friend or enemy, depending on how well you take to them, the phasor diagram is actually quite useful. So let's start off by laying the amplitudes around a regular hexagon. And again, this angle phi is the phase angle between the adjacent oscillators, which depends on um, how far we are from the source. And again, we're not going to do complicated maths. We're going to let the amplitudes all be equal. And then this is sketching out a regular polygon. And if it's a, a regular polygon, all the vertices lie on a circle. And so you do a nice little bit of trig here. Because this line, OQ, again, I, 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 I sort of said this rather quickly at the end of the lecture, but let's look at it a bit more carefully. This line OQ to A1 is obviously in the same relationship as this line QS is to A2. So if this angle's phi, then this angle here is phi. We're sweeping the thing round the polygon. Then likewise, because we're just sweeping round, let me just uh, find a different colour. Let's try it because this is you know this is quite an important point to to actually understand what's being done here in the phase or diagram. 
is that similarly, if we keep sweeping round, this total angle here, as we go round, must be n phi. Yeah? So I'll, I'll make some board notes on this in a minute. Um, so in other words, I can, uh, <coughs> I've, got a tri I've got a triangle here, which I'm going to split like this into a right angle triangle with hypotenuse r, and angle here, phi halves, yeah, that's what's being done. I've got this big angle here, which is n phi. So again, if I split this isosceles triangle into uh, a right angle triangle, clearly this angle here is n phi halves, because it's half of this angle. But again, this distance here is the same radius of the circle because the, 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 they're all, uh, with a regular polygon, all the vertices are on a circle. So again, I'll, I'll make the full board notes in a minute. What this corresponds to in, again, I, I, I'll just use this. I, I'm sorry, I've almost, I forget now that oh, I don't, I've actually got real blackboards in, in here. And, uh, but I, I'll put this up as a board note. What I'm doing is, if I go to N oscillators, yeah, I mean that, Obviously, I can't draw a picture for general n. The picture is drawn uh, in figure 63 for n is equal to 6. I'm adding up cos omega t, and then the next one is a constant phase angle phi, and the next one 2 phi, and the next one 3 phi. And depending what n is, I end up with the n minus 1 phi. So all I've got to do to get the resultant of n equal oscillators and again, it, does, you know, it starts off with, with one or two. You know, I'm coming here, out here. I've got a certain extra distance travelled towards this side of the lecture theatre of d sine theta. And, and then from this oscillator, it's 2d sine theta, 3d sine theta. Remember, th that's the physical angle, but the phase angle just goes constantly from one oscillator to the other. And you can add the terms together geometrically, as shown in figure 63. And phi could be due to this inherent phase oscillation. Plus, and of course, here we recognise our 2 pi over lambda is k. And our d sine theta is the extra distance x. This is precisely the kx part of the, of the wave. And this is the inherent oscillation. Now, we'll you know, usually put that one to naught. And then, if again, my shuffle here... <coughs> Coming back to figure 63, um, this angle O, Q, S, we've already shown is equal to phi. So I can write that this amplitude is the amplitude of one individual oscillator A. So the A is 2R sine phi halves. That's just applying uh, to this triangle O, Q, S here. The large angle OQT, this is the angle in the phasor diagram OQT, is the angle subtended by the whole of the um, hexagon. That's equal to 2R sine N phi halves. And so combining these results, this is why the phasor diagram is quite useful, combining these results by dividing them well, if I divide AR by A, I eliminate the radius of the circle, and my AR over A is equal to sine n theta halves over sine theta halves. And so normally, I would just write AR, the resultant amplitude, is the amplitude of one individual oscillator times the sine of n phi halves, where phi is the constant phase angle between the oscillators, divided by sine phi halves. And of course, remember, when I want the intensity, I'll be squaring this. The amplitude of one individual oscillator, we haven't yet come to, if you like, the absolute value of, of this. We'll, we'll wait till we do the pointing vector later on before we can really interpret this. So let's just call it I naught. But the functional dependence is clearly sine squared of n phi halves divided by sine squared phi halves. Now, when we get a new formula, it's always good to check, you know, is this going to work for a case we've already done explicitly? And we certainly did the case explicitly for uh, A is equal 
to, sorry, the number of oscillators equal to 2. We did that in our interference lecture um, on Wednesday. And so let's look at this expression. Well, we've got that sine, if n is equal to 2, this just becomes sine phi, yeah, because the 2's cancel over sine phi halves. But by trig, I can write my sine phi as 2 sine phi halves cos phi halves, yeah? So this is 2 sine phi halves cos phi halves divided by sine phi half. Obviously now this cancels out. So I've got 2, and I go, I've got my A in the front here, 2A cos phi halves. And to go back, that's precisely what we did on Wednesday. Of course, the resultant of two oscillators is 2a cos phi halves. And although this formula looks very different, the sine n phi halves over sine phi halves, you can see from this simple trig substitution that it immediately reduces to the result that we called equation 14.8. So, of course, for the case n equals 1, it's utterly trivial. This is just sine phi halves divided by sine phi halves, which is 1, and the amplitude is equal to the amplitude of the one <coughs> single oscillator. There's no interference in that case. But again, it's kind of worth checking that we get the right result also for n equals 1, which obviously we do. The resultant is just the amplitude of the single oscillator. So that's um, sort of, we've now done n source interference. We've got a quite definite formula for the resultant of n different oscillators. So um, we did it explicitly for two. We, oops, excuse me. We did it explicitly for five. And uh, now we've got this general result. So uh, I'll, let's make um, some actual notes on that because, uh, you know, I, I just sort of whizzed through it a bit. So... Let's, uh, let's look at this explicitly. So let us consider n equally spaced oscillators. Oh, the board lights don't seem to be on here. Um, that's better. Let us consider n equally spaced oscillators. And again, all of equal amplitude A. Of course, you can add up a load of waves with different amplitudes, but let's just make the maths easy so that we get on top of the, of the concepts without worrying about you know, having much more difficult sums to do. So then, the resultant R is given by... Oh, sorry, uh, I, I should say, of course, the oscillators have to be equally spaced as well, so that the... Yes, I did say that. They're equally spaced and they're of equal amplitude. In that case, the resultant R is just we take the amplitude outside and then we've got... Again, you can write it with coses or exponentials. I'll stick with what's on the um, BLE lecture notes when I did it there in terms of cosines, and then plus cos omega t plus 2 phi, plus, and then just dot, 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 obviously the series goes on until I get up to cos uh, omega t plus n minus 1 phi. And let's make that equation 15, 1. So basically, this is the maths problem, is we add up a series of cosines, each of which have got a constant phase shift with respect to each other. So that's, uh, that's all that we're doing. And again, so let's be explicit where phi is equal to alpha, which can be some arbitrary phase angle, uh, again, due to the oscillators being driven uh, deliberately uh, with some phase shift relative to each other, plus this 2 pi d sine theta over lambda. And as I mentioned, the 2 pi over lambda is, 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 is the k, and the d sine theta is the x, the extra distance travelled. And normally, we'll take the case that this is naught. Now, you might think, well, wait a minute, we, you know, I can, you know, like with my 
antenna, of course, I can connect it up to a signal generator and drive the oscillators as I like. I can't possibly do that with a diffraction grating. Well, of course I can. It's extremely easy. With a diffraction grating, instead of sending the light in normally, I send it in at an angle, and then this oscillator fires first, and then, because the wave's coming in at an angle, it reaches this one later. So this oscillator fires second. As the wave, the incoming plane wave from an angle reaches the 10,000th oscillator on the plate, they all fire successively. So I can arrange for alpha to be non-zero with a diffraction grating by the very simple uh, expedient of firing my incident wave in at an angle rather than firing it. If obviously I've got a plane wave coming in normally, it fires all the oscillators simultaneously. But if I've got a plane wave coming in at this angle, it fires them successively. And actually it's jumping on slightly, but of course there is a, there's a picture of that in the course handout, which is, I think, figure 66. Um, so <coughs> there it is. Of course, if I have got a load of oscillators scratched along here, and I've got an incoming wave here, it fires this one first, then this one, then this one, then this one, and so on. So I have got to consider, if you like, my alpha will be this part, and my kx will be this part. So again, I'll come to that in a little minute. Um, it's just, again, this is more the fundamental part. Uh, we can add the terms together. Of course, we could do the maths, but actually, as we bothered to introduce phase or diagrams, we might as well use them, because they are rather nice for this result. We can add the, 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 <coughs> the terms together geometrically, and this is illustrated in figure 63. of the course handouts, and uh, as I say, this is this, uh, sorry, it's rather scribbled over now, but you've got your own versions that aren't scribbled over, so just the next tiny bit of maths will refer to this diagram. So, let's do that bit of uh, maths. Um, so, the angle, let's move, a bit shadow, isn't it, here, yeah, the angle OQS is phi, which follows from uh, uh, the polygon vertices lying on um, a circle. So we can definitely write A is equal to 2R sine phi halves. And the large angle, this is subtended by the Remember, that our rule for the phase or diagram, the resultant is always obtained by joining the origin to the end point of the, the six, in this case, six imaginary vectors. In the general case, n imaginary vectors. Sorry, not, sorry, not imaginary, fictional vectors that we're adding up. So the large angle OQT in that diagram is n phi. So we can also write that the resultant amplitude, A sub R, is equal to 2R uh, sine n phi halves. And, well, this is now a trivial piece of maths. I mean, of your skill of maths now, but I'll just do it explicitly. Combining these results to eliminate R, and obviously all I've got to do is divide one equation by the other here, I get that the AR is equal to A times sine n phi, sorry, let me write it like this, sine n phi halves over sine phi halves. And let's, uh, this is an important equation, equation 15.2. So that is the general, if I add n oscillators equally spaced, all giving the same amplitude, which you know, in, 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 the, in the light case would be normal plane wave hitting a diffraction grating, this is my amplitude as a function of phase angle. And of course I can always then relate my phase angle to the angle in real space because I've got this, you know, kx is d sine theta. 
So I can calculate for any arbitrary direction in space using um, this uh, formula. So uh, it's a very nice to have a general formula for adding up that series of cosines. You know, if you prefer to you know, add, them, add up the complex exponentials, do it mathematically, of course that's equally as good as using the phasor diagram. It's just an alternative geometrical method, this one, that happens to give a nice result very quickly for that um, calculation. So also remember the resultant intensity, because we're usually interested in the intensity or the irradiance of the light, is I. The resultant intensity I is I is equal to some I naught. That's A naught squared. And we'll, as I say, we'll come back to absolute values of this later. The, what interests us now is this functional part. Sine squared, oh, excuse me, sine squared of n phi halves over sine squared of phi halves. And again, because I, I, I think that was an important little calculation to show that we get the right result for two oscillators. You see, we've derived this for diffraction with n, n large. That's our aim. We've got 10,000 oscillators in our grating. But it sure as hell got to be right. Diffraction and interference aren't different. It's just, and I can certainly set n equals 2 in this formula. So substitute, and this is again an equation worth numbering up. So substituting n equals 2 into equation 15, 2. So substituting n equals 2 here, again, I, I won't I'll go through it. Obviously, if I substitute n is equal to 2, this just becomes sine phi over sine phi halves. And using the standard trig relationship that sine phi is 2 sine phi halves cos phi halves, we get, and then this is obviously now I've got two sine phi halves, cos phi halves, the sine phi halves cancel, we get that the resultant AR must be equal to 2A cos phi halves. And this one, let's go on here, uh, this result We'd be worried if it didn't, agrees with equation. I think I numbered it in the VLE notes at 14.8. So, uh, of course, we, we must go down to the, the correct limit when we um, take the case n equals 2. So, that is a cast iron. We now know how to, how to add up for any case n, and we've, we've shown it agrees with our explicit treatment of two sources. And um, I'd now like to go on to look at equation 15.3. What is going on there that we can, of course, plot it? Now, specifically, I'm going to plot it in the region of small phase angles. Now, remember that n... Just uh, for a humble diffraction grating, we know that n is an ordinary diffraction grating is of the order of 10 to the 4. Yeah, that's just a, just a physical fact. That would be an ordinary diffraction grating. So n phi halves, yeah, is a very rapid, very, 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 very rapidly oscillating function compared with sine phi halves. Sine phi halves near the origin, where phi is small, is hardly changed at all. Yeah? It's basically constant. You've got a function that's oscillating in the numerator, let's say 10,000 times as rapidly as the trigonometric function in the denominator just from the fact that we've got a lot of oscillators, that n is, n is large. So the denominator <coughs> in equation 15.3 for phi small is effectively constant. Yeah? It's just a constant. And also, 
if we like, we can use our Maclaurin series expansions <laughs> of the sign uh, as well. We can get uh, a, we, we, we can use uh, that this is basically going to be just phi halves. Now we've got a very slowly varying function here. So this is a very rapidly varying function. So the zeros of this function, you know, like, again, we're interested, if you like, now in calculating the intensity as a function of phase angle. And we saw that we got zero, for the explicit case, n is equal to five zeros at two pi fifth, four pi fifth, and so on. Um, we have got the situation now where the denominator is basically constant. So all we've got to do is to find the zeros is look for the zeros in the numerator. And uh, in particular, I want to plot this function near the origin. And that is what, if I've still got the view graph, I'm going to do next. Uh, <coughs> there we go, the usual problem. It's in here somewhere. So I'll tell you what, while I hunt around, why don't I pass a few diffraction gratings around? Then you can have a oh, by the way, uh, Ian will, 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 will skin me. if you Don't put fingerprints on them. Could you just hold them this way round? You can hold these to the lights, look at a few pretty colours, and I'll, and I'll sort my view graphs out. So there we go. I think I've got enough for each row. If, yeah, if you could just hold them up. Well-planned lecture. <laughs> Could you maybe take a, a, a diffraction grating and pass it along? And I shall try and clip myself back on here. Oops. Is it picking up again? Yeah? Nice one. Right. So, the, of course, the, you know, like, it's boring if you look at... Uh, I mean, you've got to, it, it's got, you know, like, again, fiddle around with it. If you want to get the colours, you've got to sort of fiddle around, sort of, and, and try and get a f fairly intense light. And as, as you change the, the kind of incident angle, you should get different colours. Uh, it's not very bright in here, but um, it's at least something to do while I sort my view graphs out. And they're in here somewhere. Grr. Hmm. Right. Okay. We we'll have an edit here, Hugo. We, you know, what do they say in the in the films? Cut. <laughs> Lecturer shuffles view graphs while uh, hunting through here. Ha. So, we can come back from the cut now, we've, uh, we, we've got, uh, I found the, the, the relevant view graph, so um, <coughs> the, the intensity function is plotted in figure 64 of the course handout for the case n is very large. You know, I think this actual plot is made for n of about 100. And um, you can see the, uh, the shape of this function uh, very, very clearly. And this is, um, it's plotted so that you'll kind of, if you like, normalise by dividing by I naught and N squared. I mean, again, we've seen this with five oscillators. With, with that function, um, with five oscillators, we got this function 1 plus cos 2 phi plus 2 cos 2 phi. And of course, when the phase angle phi is naught, everything in our series just adds up. So everything in our series... Uh, simply adds up 
at phi is equal to zero. So the function is five for the amplitude at the origin. So the um, intensity is 25 times that of an individual oscillator. And of course, this result applies because once the phase angle is zero, we're adding up cos omega t plus cos omega t plus cos omega t plus cos omega t. We get n cos omega t when phi is equal to zero. And so we get uh, the uh, origin always is n squared times the intensity of the individual oscillator. So the usual way to plot this function is to divide that out so that it's one at the origin. And then you can see this function has comes down very rapidly here. This is, remember, n phi halves over 2 pi, and we explicitly did the case for, 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 for uh, getting the zeros for the case n is equal to 5. So we've, we've done that case explicitly. And you can see this function comes down, has a zero, and then has a small bump, and this is blown up. In all, this bump now, the subsidiary bumps are now really small compared with the main bump when everything adds up in phase. So it's actually to show it so that it's not kind of like hugging the line here. This is blown up by a factor 10. So this dotted line here are the subsidiary bumps, which all, would almost disappear completely on this scale, blown up by a factor 10 to show what the function actually looks like. And if we want these zeros, well, that's dead easy. Because, let's look at this thing here, we're, we're, unlike we're, we're saying, this is so rapidly varying, this function, this is just a constant yeah, at, at, the, uh, at the point that we're interested in. So what we actually want to know is when, if I want to identify these zeros, they're when sine n phi over 2 is equal to, well, naught, 2 pi, 4 pi, oh, 3 got my pi, my 3 pi, there's my sine function, and uh, there it's going along. Well, clearly, uh, if the, um, <coughs> this, is, this is the case, uh, I've got this, um, so n phi over halves, this is equal to, no, this function, sine n phi is equal to naught, at naught pi, and so on, then I've got the possible, I've got to be careful with this one, yeah, because uh, if I'm close to the, origin of this function. I'll come back to this when I do single slit diffraction. I've got to be careful that the first zero is actually when this is equal to 3 pi halves and, uh, and, this is, and, and then 5 pi halves and 7 pi halves and so on. So I can I easily identify the um, zeros of the function, and I can easily calculate the intensities of the subsidiary maxima as well. And, uh, I, yeah, I think I've got time um, to, to look at that. So, um, let, no, I think actually I'll, I'd like to, you know, like set up what we're going to do next week conceptually in the last uh, few minutes, because so, we're going to come back to a very, very similar function to this for slit diffraction. And th it's very weird that we start off doing uh, two source interference, then say five or six, that's the way we've gone, and now we've done N, lots of oscillators. You might think, well, we've missed out one oscillator. You, well, you think, well, one oscillator is nothing, it just there's no interference. But you've done a lot of your single slit diffraction. Yeah. And we know that if we send light through a narrow slit, it forms a diffraction pattern. And in fact, the intensity of light passing through a single slit is exactly this function. And you might think, well, that's a bit weird. This is a function of n oscillators where n is a very large number. And the way we calculate single slit diffraction is to... Imagine that we, uh, well, I, I say I'll make proper board notes on this less next week, but um, it's important to get the concept of what we're doing. So far, 
when we've added oscillators, it's been like we've taken two oscillators and then we've added a third, fourth, fifth and sixth. We've now gone up to 10,000. But we've been adding them so that the array gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah? So that the giant maxima are all at, for example, sine theta is equal to 1, 2, 3 times uh, lambda over d. Now let's consider a different situation where we fix the width of the array and start to fill it in with more and more oscillators. And what we do in this, so imagine that first of all we hold the entire width of this linear array constant, yeah? And we just have at the beginning the two source problem, yeah? We then start to fill in more and more oscillators. And in fact, I, I say I've got some view graphs on this, and I'll, I'll put, uh, yeah, I'll run through it just conceptually for five minutes what we're going to do next week. And I'll do all the maths explicitly um, that next time. So, again, let's just uh, let's do the concept uh, now. I'll come back to many sources. We've got a whole week doing diffraction next week, and I think this is the most important thing. So imagine that we start off with two sources. Yeah. Now this is very different to the problem. Now when I start to fill in, I'm changing the spacing between the adjacent oscillators, holding the width of the array constant. Yeah. This is now a very different idea to just adding more to the array at the end. So let's say we hold that whole array constant and we slip in four other sources. Because, you know, we've looked at the case um, n is equal to uh, 6. And then we slip another few in, each between the other, other ones. And that's a bit like our Yagi antenna. We've now got 10 or 11 oscillators. But we can continue this process indefinitely and when we have continued the process indefinitely we have got a continuum of sources and the whole thing is a slit of width delta so if I illuminate if I send a plane wave up here and it hits these two oscillators simultaneously I'll get the diffraction pattern that we've calculated if I send a plane wave up here Remember the D is the individual spacing of the oscillators is now smaller, but if I hit them all with a plane wave simultaneously, I'll get a diffraction pattern that we know how to calculate. I could go on and on, but now I fill it in with a load of oscillators, and in the limit, they're infinitesimally spaced, I've now got effectively a single slit being illuminated. Because imagine that outside here, I've got an opaque wall and an opaque wall, and here I've just got a slit which is illuminated. All the light's absorbed at this end and this end, and then I've got an infinite number of infinitesimally spaced oscillators, and they constitute the single slit. So it's a very odd way of proceeding conceptually, but it's the best way to calculate slit diffraction is to do it in this limit. And uh, the way it works, well, first of all, there is a difference to what we've done before. Because remember, our condition for the giant maxima is always m lambda over d. Now, if I take the limit that, remember, the d now is the separation between the individual oscillators. I've held the array width constant, not the separation of the oscillators. The separation of the individual oscillators is now getting smaller and smaller. So at some point, well, if d is certainly in the end infinitesimally small, this must be greater. The wavelength is, is finite, and we're dividing it by something infinitesimally small. We are going to clearly reach the point where there's no solution for this except for the straight through beam. So there are no subsidiary giant maxima at all. We lose them, but we still get this pattern. This, this is called, you know, it's actually called the Loch Ness Monster function because uh, of its shape near the origin. And um, what we're going, and again, the concept, and I apologise to people who've not done any optics, like the maths and physics students, the 
the, 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 the theoretical physics students, physics and philosophy students, you're going straight in at the deep end next week because we're going to do what's called Fourier optics, even though you've not studied this in a kind of more elementary way. So uh, if particularly if you're in that group, this is a, um, a, a, a tricky step. So the, the, you lose the giant maxima, we lose them, but we still get the side lobes because, and, and again, remember, like we calculated that thing for a diffraction grating, n could be 10,000, you know, but we could take n to be a million or 10 to the 8, and then eventually an infinite number of infinitesimal oscillators. But now, instead of adding up lots of individual oscillators, if x is the distance going across the slit, it now becomes a continuous variable. Yeah? So x becomes a continuous variable. So Instead of having d sine theta the d due to the discrete distance between individual oscillators, I'm going to have to integrate over the continuous variable x. I've still got, of course, the same k here. So what will happen is, and again, I took this example of adding five oscillators. Yeah? Uh, instead of adding five oscillators, I have to evaluate this integral of e to the i phi dx if the slit is of width w, the natural place to put the origin is that x is equal to zero, and I integrate from w halves to w minus halves, but now my phi is this continuous variable, which is 2 pi x sine theta over lambda. And now if you're very sharp, you'll see that if we interpret the periodicity of the function u as equal to sine theta over lambda, this integral is e to the 2 pi i x u, and that is precisely a Fourier transform. And then likewise, because when I'm doing the integration, remember, I'm now doing a physical case where a plane wave illuminates the slit and this is all black on the outside and this is white across here, I can extend my integral from minus w halves to plus w halves, where the middle of my slit of, is here, I can extend it to infinity because I'm just adding in a lot of zeros. Yeah? I, can add, I can add in an infinite amount of zeros and so I will have to now, to calculate single slit diffraction, I have to do this integral where I interpret u as equal to sine theta over lambda and this is precisely a Fourier transform. And I w you know, this is very important to get, to, to get, and this is why you're studying Fourier transforms. Well, there are other applications, but this is a very powerful reason for doing the Fourier transforms this term, is that always the amplitude in any, in any kind of diffraction problem is obtained as a Fourier transform of the aperture function. Anyway, so we'll do that in detail next week, but at least we've kind of really set it up this time. And Ian will also skim me if I don't get the diffraction gratings back. So if you could bring those back, I've got a little box, and I think the box went round actually, so if you could bring those back and, and pop them in the box. Thanks, Sean. Where did the box 